We provide bold legal insight and business leadership to forward-thinking people and organizations. We believe in better and bold outcomes and meticulous focus in finding the solutions others might miss by building our practice around the best minds in the legal profession and outside of it too. We believe the pursuit of better starts with people, our colleagues, our clients, and the people who depend on them. We are committed to truly understanding the individual needs of those who depend on us so we can help them go from where they are to where they want to be. We are. We are. We are. We are. We are. Hush Blackwell. Hush Blackwell. Hush Blackwell. We are Hush Blackwell. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to In the Antitrust Crosshairs. Um, can HR or recruiting practices lead to lawsuits or prosecution? And if it's morning where you are, then good morning. My name is Jody Rudman. Uh, I am a former federal prosecutor and a law partner in Hush Blackwell's Austin office. Uh, and I practice in the area of white collar and government investigations. And I will introduce you to my co-presenters in just a moment. Uh, but I do want to say on behalf of all of us that we're very excited to have you here today and excited to speak with you about a topic that's pretty active right now in the labor markets, uh, where we're seeing a lot of new enforcement activity and a developing state of the law. And uh, I hope that you'll hear about that as the hour uh, progresses. I do want to say a few housekeeping matters before we get started. Um, at the bottom of your audience console, there should be multiple application icons, and those are for you to use during the program today. Um, first of all, if you have questions, then um, please submit your questions using the question box. We're going to try to answer all of your questions uh, during the webcast today, but if a fuller answer is needed or if we start to run out of time, because this is kind of an action-packed hour, uh, please permit us to get to your question at a later date by answering it for you via email. Uh, please know that even if we can't answer it uh, during the webcast, we definitely appreciate you asking. We appreciate your participation, and we certainly encourage you to submit questions. Um, second of all, there um, will be a PDF of this presentation available for you in the resources folder. Um, we do have approval for this presentation for CLE credit. So if you would like to report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of your screen and there will be a certificate of attendance and course numbers that will be emailed to you tomorrow along with a recording of today's webcast. And then toward the end of the program, we would ask you to complete a real short survey uh, because we'll be using your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your desires and business needs. So uh, that's all the housekeeping stuff. I do want to introduce my co-presenters today. Uh, with me are Wendy Ahrens, who is a partner in our Madison office um, with our healthcare group but Wendy navigates complex antitrust issues and competition issues across a range of industries that arise during mergers and acquisitions and collaborations between competitors. Uh, Kevin Karanka is a law partner in our Austin, Texas office with the Labor and Employment Group, uh, and Kevin enjoys a complex area of law that has a, a very people-focused element. We have Mark Toby as well, who is senior counsel in our Austin office with the Food and Agriculture Group. And Mark counsels clients on antitrust and competition issues, helping clients mitigate and navigate risk in this increasingly complex business and regulatory environment. So again, thank you for um, tuning in. We have a short poll, if you would be so kind as to answer uh, the question, what is your role in your organization? And for those of you for whom CLE depends on participating in the poll, make sure that you do participate. There will be three poll questions so that you'll be sure to get your CLE credit. So um, if you uh, just click on the appropriate bubble there, and while you're doing that, we'll go ahead and move to an overview of today's presentation. So. 
So it looks like a lot of you are other and general counsel. Great. So a quick overview of what you're going to hear in the next 55 or so minutes. Uh, we'll get into just a brief overview of the antitrust law with particular emphasis on those aspects of antitrust that relate to HR and labor and employment issues. Um, and of recent note, uh, no poach agreements and wage fixing agreements, which can lead to and are leading to civil lawsuits and criminal prosecution. In the course of that, we're gonna give you some issue recognition and issue spotting tools uh, to give you some opportunities to kind of see the lay of the land and start to learn to spot issues and figure out what to do about them should they arise. Uh, we're going to talk to you about non-competes um, uh, and hopefully non-competes that remain surviving and legitimate even in today's climate. Uh, and then we're going to get into risk reduction and risk mitigation strategies should you be on the receiving end of, of some negative uh, inquiry or enforcement effort. And again, just um, final uh, push for you to ask questions along the way um, or you know, use that function to um, help us guide the conversation. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Wendy to talk to you about antitrust law. Thanks, Jody. really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, just wanted to give you a, a brief uh, 50,000 foot overview of, of the purpose of antitrust law, which then helps set the table for why the antitrust enforcers um, are so focused on no poach and wage fixing agreements these days. Um, so antitrust law is, is really, uh, you know, uh, there to protect consumers and protect free and fair competition. Um, the thinking behind uh, antitrust law and, and why it's so important uh, to enforcers is that increased competition leads to a number of benefits uh, for consumers um, and, and for the um, industries uh, in which uh, businesses are competing. And that includes lower prices um, and also within the healthcare industry, potentially lower reimbursement rates. Um, it can also lead to increased quality of healthcare, um, increased quality of uh, other types of services that are provided along with um, new and innovative products, uh, increased uh, access to uh, certain types of specialists or service lines, um, along with increased convenience um, for patients who are uh, consumers of healthcare. Um, and in particular, um, the, the focus, uh, as Jody mentioned, of the government antitrust enforcers on no poach and wage fixing agreements um, is because they view these as uh, somehow uh, uh, stifling competition uh, between companies or uh, that it's bad for the employees in that it suppresses their wages, restricts their mobility, and also uh, potentially uh, affects other terms of their employment negatively. Um, and so just going, turning uh, and focusing on what no poach and wage fixing agreements constitute, um, they are uh, an agreement, uh, and we can talk about that more later, uh, between competitors um, that relates to uh, not soliciting or hiring each other's employees. Um, a wage fixing agreement is an agreement uh, to uh, keep wages at a certain level or within a certain range. Um, and this can also include an agreement as to the types of benefits that are offered to employees. Um, and, and I will say that antitrust enforcers uh, take a broader view of who actually competes for labor than they do of uh, which healthcare providers or, or others in the healthcare industry are competing at, for certain service lines or for various products. So for example, um, healthcare providers who employ certain types of specialists uh, might be viewed uh, by antitrust enforcers as competing more broadly um, so perhaps competing regionally or even nationally, depending on the type of specialty at issue. Um, so you shouldn't assume that because your uh, particular healthcare system or your, your provider group is, is outside of, uh, it, your, your sort of competition is outside of a service area, um, that you're not actually competing uh, for employees and, and providers. 
Finally, um, antitrust laws, uh, there are both federal and state antitrust laws uh, that prohibit uh, wage fixing and no poaching agreements. And um, they're enforced by state and federal uh, antitrust enforcers, as I mentioned. Um, these include the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, state attorneys general, and uh, private persons who uh, bring uh, lawsuits. Um, the Federal Sherman Act is written very broadly. Um, and so uh, uh, there has been over the years a lot of case law that interprets uh, what the Sherman Act covers. Um, and, but at its core, it requires a proof of an agreement between independent entities or individuals that unreasonably restrains trade. And the state law counterparts to Section 1 of the Sherman Act, uh, which is what we're focused here today, um, are, are very similar. Um, however, there are some states where the interpretation of uh, their uh, little Sherman Act might be slightly different. I'm going to turn it over now to Mark Toby in our Austin office, who's going to talk more about uh, why you should care about complying with antitrust law. Thank you, Wendy. Um, my name is Mark Toby, as Wendy said, uh, and I am uh, a former both state prosecutor and federal prosecutor. Uh, I was with the state attorney general's office in Texas for 20 years doing antitrust uh, prosecution and with the antitrust division of the Justice Department for 10 years. Uh, left there a, a, a couple of years ago and came to Hush Blackwell. Uh, why should you care about antitrust law? Well, as you know, both Wendy and Jody have said, this is a new uh, point of emphasis for antitrust law that is invading your area of the world, the labor and employment area of the world. Maybe you Maybe you didn't have to pay much attention to antitrust law before, but now DOJ and FTC and the state AGs have all indicated this is a priority for them because they feel like restraints in the labor market may be hurting the economy. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the DOJ, which is the one that prosecutes for criminal violations of the antitrust law has, uh, you know, made a statement and is engaging in a, uh, a long uh, process of trying to um, prosecute no poach and wage fixing agreements as criminal violations. So criminal violations means jail time. Uh, and jail time in, in this particular case can mean jail time for the people who made the agreement because DOJ is determined to go after individuals as well as companies. It may mean fines. It may mean uh, suspension from government contracting. It would certainly mean reputational damage to your company. It may also mean uh, follow-on civil suits, which we'll talk about. And those civil suits um, you know, can be tens of millions of dollars and have been in some wage-fixing cases that we've seen in the past. Uh, we didn't explain in that first bullet what a per se offense is. I think, you know, we, the shorthand is uh, wage fixing and price and, and uh, no poach if it is naked and, and there's no justification for it, which we'll explain later, is considered to be per se. Uh, and, and you do not consider any benefits in evaluating uh, the conduct, and that is the predicate for a criminal antitrust offense. Could we go to the next slide? So part and parcel of these antitrust illegal agreements uh, under Section 1 of the Sherman Act or state analogs to those acts is there must be an agreement. Uh, but it's not just the kind of agreement that you might think of, you know, from, you know, sort of the ADM antitrust cases and things like that, where people are sitting around a smoke-filled room and, and dividing up a market. Uh, no, it's, it can be inferred from emails and conduct. You know, it is not limited to an express agreement. So we'll see when we talk about some of these cases that 
Even inappropriate or excessive information sharing could be a basis for suspecting an agreement. And uh, just, you know, acting in a, a parallel manner with other, uh, other companies in the industry who are seeking to suppress wages or have no poach agreements can, in some cases, also lead to an inference of agreement. So i send it back to you, Wendy. Thanks, Mark. Um, so in late 2016, as, as Mark alluded to, uh, toward the end of the, the Obama administration, the Department of Justice and the FTC issued some new joint guidance. Uh, and for anybody who follows the FTC and DOJ, you'll know that it's very rare for them to issue joint guidance. So when they do, it's, it's you know, a, a big red flag for the legal community uh, to take a look at it and, and advise clients appropriately. In addition, this joint guidance was titled Antitrust Guidance for HR Professionals. So it was actually directed at human resources professionals, um, which is also notable. Um, the big headline from this joint guidance that was issued in 2016 is that DOJ stated that it will seek criminal prosecution uh, for any naked agreements uh, to uh, engage in, in no poaching or wage fixing. Um, and this, uh, this shift in strategy really represented a sea change uh, because prior to 2016, these types of agreements uh, had only been uh, pursued civilly. Um, the guidance lays out the civil actions that it had previously uh, brought uh, against various individuals and entities, including some in the healthcare space. Um, so that in and of itself is interesting to see the catalog because obviously this is not a new issue. Um, but again, the, the, the sort of bright uh, shining uh, light from this guidance is that um, they will not hesitate to seek criminal prosecution. Um, and also, you know, they outlined why uh, they will uh, not hesitate to do so. Um, in particular, um, as we've mentioned, because these naked agreements can suppress wages, they're bad for the economy and, and limit employee mobility. And even though this guidance was issued in 2016, we waited and waited and waited um, for the first criminal prosecution. Um, there were speeches by DOJ and there were some civil uh, lawsuits in the area of no poach and wage fixing, um, but there was no criminal indictment handed down until late 2020. Um, and as you can see uh, from some of these headlines um, and what Mark and Jody will talk about next, really um, in December 2020, the floodgates opened with respect to uh, criminal prosecution of no poach and wage fixing. And in particular, it was focused in the healthcare industry. Um, Jody, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk about surgical care affiliates. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so the wait is over. Um, you'll hear in a moment about the Jindal case, which was filed in late 2020 that deals with wage fixing. But I'm going to talk to you about the Surgical Care Affiliates case, which was filed in early 2021 and is the bellwether criminal case involving um, an alleged no poach agreement. Um, this case is pending currently in the Northern District of Texas. It is set for trial in May of 2022. So we, we have a bit of time before we see how it shakes out. But um, originally filed in early 2021, a superseding indictment was returned in July of 2021. There is a pending motion to dismiss by the defendants that's not been ruled on. So at the moment, this is moving forward full steam ahead. Um, it is a two count criminal indictment um, charging surgical care affiliates with engaging in conspiracies to violate the Sherman Act by having alleged no poach agreements with competitors not to recruit, solicit and hire one another's senior level executives and quoted in the superseding indictment are various um, emails in which this, you know, alleged agreement not to solicit senior level execs 
um, was communicated or at least affirmed by email. And the indictment also alludes to um, meetings or efforts to really oversee and enforce this alleged no poach agreement. And the allegation there is that this type of arrangement is a, a, a dividing up or an allocation of the labor market among those senior level executives, which as you've been hearing, um, is seen by the Department of Justice as a suppression of, of competition and, and free movement within the labor market. Um, it's notable, I think, that there is a follow-on class action civil lawsuit that's pending in the Northern District of Illinois involving as the putative class all those who are alleged to have been hurt by this alleged no poach agreement. Um, but also notable and not on this slide is that a second criminal indictment involving another alleged participant in this arrangement is now also pending in the District of Colorado. And uh, that case is pending against Davida, who is, uh, as I said, another participant allegedly in this arrangement. So these bellwether criminal cases are kind of the beginning of what Wendy um, told you about, you know, was forecasted in 2016 in the no poach area. You'll see the same thing in the wage fixing area, and I'll turn it over to Mark to talk about that. Right. And um, we've been getting good questions. One of the questions I hope this will illustrate uh, is, you know, a competitor. We are talking about an agreement between competitors. Uh, and um, in these criminal cases, what you're going to see is they are competitors in uh, the same industry who hire the same kinds of employees. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in these criminal cases. Theoretically, you know, the, the, the labor market for employees could be, you know, much larger involving companies that, that your company or, or a firm might not consider to be their direct competitor. But in these criminal cases, we're seeing companies in the same industry. So in Jindal, which happened to be another Texas indictment uh, in uh, 2020, and there was a superseding indictment for this one too, indicating that DOJ is very actively involved in these cases. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, an allegation of a conspiracy to uh, fix or lower wages uh, for physical therapy uh, 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 providers and physical therapy assistants. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the setting for this is very familiar to antitrust lawyers. You know, the, these companies that are staffing companies sell their services to like home health agencies and they get paid a certain margin between what they pay their nurses or physical therapists and what they are paid by the home health agency. And that margin was going down. So uh, the allegations in Jindal was, uh, were that this company thought that physical therapists were, you know, their pay was getting out of line. So they went and actually, you know, approached other physical therapy staffing companies to see if they agreed. And um, several companies agreed or indicated that, uh, that, that they thought that was a good idea. And uh, the other shoe is not dropped in this case. You know, there, the other companies involved, I don't think, have been um, indicted yet. But there are other companies alleged to have been involved. And so the idea was uh, the, the, the margin is getting out of line. We need to draw the line on pay. And so there was email correspondence. There was a lot of things going on between uh, Jindal's company and other companies. Some companies, you know, uh, actually said agree. You know, one company did a thumbs up emoji. You know, there are different ways. This sort of illustrates what we were saying about agreement. Uh, the, the, the feds inferred agreement from something less than the smoke filled room situation. So, uh, you know, the other interesting fact about this uh, is that the, the, the feds and the state of Texas in this case did, did not start out looking for these agreements. They were looking at something else 
and came upon, I'm sure it would be emails between this company and other companies. And then they referred the case criminally to a grand jury uh, in Texas. So uh, that is the way some of these cases arise. All of your media are fair game for DOJ, you know, to look at to see if there's agreement. Uh, any kind of investigation could lead to a referral. Um, and, and in this case, where one company is sharing what it is paying for physical therapists with another company that may be hiring physical therapists, that's inappropriate or excessive information sharing. So that's how the government uh, inferred agreement here. And I think we go next to uh, a kind of a combination case. Uh, this is an indictment out of Nevada, out of uh, Las Vegas, um, where uh, again, it was a, it's, it's a staffing agency. This one was for school nurses, for special needs kids. And uh, they contacted the only other authorized uh, staffing agency for this school district and said, we need to do something about how much we're paying for these nurses. You know, uh, we actually have some uh, from the indictment, we have some uh, excerpts from the emails, you know, where they're giving assurances that we will not recruit any of your active nurses. That would be a no poach agreement. And then tell the nurse, no, we have a deal not to poach. That's an act, that's an active no poaching agreement. And in this particular case, they also agreed to suppress the wages of the nurses that were involved. So uh, DOJ is trying every way it can think of to find uh, a combination of charges uh, that will get a court to say that no poaching and wage fixing are per se, i.e. criminal antitrust violations. And so far they haven't succeeded but you can see from these cases how hard they're trying. So I think we go to Wendy. Thanks, Mark. Um, just to give folks a, a little bit of background as to, to where some of these criminal indictments came from, um, talking about some of the, the more notable civil lawsuits um, that have uh, been brought in the past, oh, uh, five, five or six years. Um, the first one that comes to mind is the uh, Dr. Siemens lawsuit against Duke University and UNC. Um, you, you, you may know Duke and UNC as, as uh, fierce rivals for basketball, but apparently they decided they didn't want to compete as vigorously uh, for uh, providers. And Dr. Seaman uh, was a radiologist who brought an antitrust uh, claim alleging agreements in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act between Duke and UNC that essentially prohibited her ability to uh, switch jobs from one university to the other. And in particular, you can see the language in red that was uh, Exhibit A uh, in terms of her claim. Um, but uh, UNC and Duke uh, ultimately uh, settled the case at various points. Um, UNC settled pretty early on, um, and Duke continued on as as a defendant, but ultimately settled in 2019. Um, and and the thing that's interesting about this case, in addition to kind of the this uh, sort of guideline that Duke and UNC apparently established, where they agreed uh, not to not to hire each other's uh, faculty uh, medical faculty. Um, is that DOJ also submitted a statement of interest as part of uh, some of the, the court filings here, urging the court to reject any arguments that an agreement uh, not to poach would, would somehow be exempt from antitrust liability um, and, and you know, urge the court to um, analyze it under, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the per se analysis um, and that it was a naked no poach agreement um, that's essentially market allocation. Uh, another notable civil case uh, that I'll just touch on brief briefly um, is the what I call the Detroit nurses case. Uh, so back in 2012, a group of uh, Detroit area nurses brought a class action wage fixing lawsuit alleging that um, a number of, of area hospitals uh, agreed amongst themselves to 
um, suppress or somehow limit wages paid to nurses. And um, th the reason that this case is so notable, in addition to it being a class action against a number of hospitals, is that um, while the court did not reach uh, any sort of decision on the merits, um, it did in one of the uh, summary judgment um, decisions um, find that there was substantial evidence that the area hospitals had actually regularly exchanged nurses' compensation uh, information, that they had done it through not only email, but direct contacts um, between employees um, and through healthcare industry uh, meetings and organizations. Um, and that the, any sort of third party surveys that they were uh, using and responding to um, in terms of uh, wages or compensation, um, these didn't satisfy the safety zone requirements of the healthcare statements that have been issued by the FTC and DOJ. So while there wasn't any smoking gun of an alleged agreement, um, there, there were these just kind of various uh, types of information sharing that the court found altogether um, pointed towards uh, substantial evidence of a violation. And of course, this case settled um, for a lot of money, all, all told about 90 million. Um, these obviously can be very expensive endeavors. And, and so um, Jody and Mark are gonna take you through a couple of hypotheticals to help you issue spot um, with respect to no poach and wage fixing. Yeah, let's, let's turn this into some, um... I mean, not real life, but <laughs> real life-ish examples. And this may get at some of the questions that are coming up in the um, Q&A box, but I want to make sure you guys know that we see those and, and are, are trying to address them, and we'll get to them, if not today, then certainly afterward. But for our first hypothetical, um, and uh, please participate in the poll when you get the opportunity, here's the hypo. I work in the HR department of a university that sometimes gets into bidding wars to attract senior level employees. Those efforts rarely succeed, but they take up a lot of time, energy, and resources. Recently, I was told that we now have a handshake agreement with another university not to recruit each other's senior level employees. There isn't a written agreement. Uh, our efforts before this to hire one another's faculty were rarely successful. And by the way, this saves a lot of time and I'm not unhappy about it. So the question for you all to answer in the poll is, is this legal? Uh, and if you just take a moment and consider that. Yes, no, or I don't know. And I don't know is perfectly okay because we're going to talk to you about the answer in a minute. And Wendy, do you want to go ahead and advance and we can see what, how the answers are coming out? A lot of you are saying no, great. And a lot of you are saying I don't know, which is perfectly okay. Um, so let me move to the answer slide. The answer is no. Um, and we loaded this up with um, a lot of sort of criteria that, you know, that might make you scratch your head and think, well, you know, maybe it is, but I'm going to explain to you why it's not. First of all, you might have been thinking, well, it's not written down. So, you know, it might be okay if it's not written. Unfortunately, that's not correct. Um, and a legal agreement can be oral. Uh, it need not be written down as long as there is a witness who will testify uh, provably to the government that an agreement such as this existed, or it can be inferred, as you've seen from some of the prior case examples from activities or emails or other communications, uh, then the agreement can be deemed to have existed um, and, um, and can be deemed illegal. Um, to the other sort of thing we loaded into this is that the person who's posing this hypo doesn't mind, actually likes it. It doesn't matter. Um, even if the alleged illegal agreement has a perceived benefit and everybody really likes uh, the result of it, that doesn't matter in terms of the way the government views it. Um, 
even if, and this was another sort of issue that we loaded into the hypo, even if, you know, this didn't really move the needle much because prior efforts to recruit from the other competitor universities weren't successful anyway, so this didn't really make a difference, that doesn't matter. Um, if you stopped the efforts to recruit because there was an agreement not to, uh, and you've agreed to do that, then you have you can be deemed to have joined a conspiracy to allocate the labor market and, and violate the antitrust laws. Um, so uh, on the other bidding, uh, I'm sorry, on the other bullet points, it, as you heard Mark mention earlier, the, the term per se or naked, uh, if the no poaching agreement is naked, meaning it's not part and parcel of or appended to an otherwise legitimate reason to restrain competition, then the DOJ will view it after the 2016 guidance as being a naked no poach agreement that is um, subject to uh, investigation and prosecution under the criminal laws. Um, so that's kind of that hypothetical. I'll turn it over, I think, to Mark for a wage fixing hypo. Yes, we're gonna do the same thing with wage fixing. Um, in, in answering this question, I'm gonna try to touch on some of the questions that we're getting, which are very good, that deal with like vendor customer relationships. And I know Kevin, when he talks about non-competes, will also talk more generally about this, but, the hypothetical on wage fixing is uh, is this one. My friend and I are account managers at different staffing companies. We recruit in similar industries where wage growth seems to be out of control. Over lunch, my friend proposed that we could solve this problem by reaching out to other industry leaders to establish a more reasonable and consistent pay scale for uh, recruits and wants to exchange current pay scales. You know, question is, is this legal? So if you can hit your poll button, uh, we appreciate it. And then maybe we should just see what the results look like. I saw something initially on the slide, but then it went away. But. Uh, why don't we just go to the answer? Um, the answer is it's not legal. Um, we're talking about wage fixing here. You know, these cases are analogized to territorial allocation. Uh, this is, you know, sort of reasoning by analogy for DOJ. Territorial allocation uh, is per se illegal. Uh, there's no inquiry required as to whether it is naked or not. I mean, it's just per se illegal. So in these particular agreements, um, it was an, a, a discussion of an agreement to set wages or establish a pay scale, and that makes it an illegal wage fixing agreement. You know, if it, if it were, if the, if the conduct could be proved, you know, taking the suggestion, you might view this as an invitation to collude. And then if you, in fact, never said a word, but started doing it or your company started doing it, uh, an agreement on wage fixing could be inferred. And um, similarly, exchanging pay scale information, which is part of the hypothetical, could lead to an inference that there was an agreement intended here. Um, it doesn't matter that you know wages are out of control, as we've talked about it. The court will not look at that sort of excuse or efficiency. So this doesn't involve the vertical, you know, vendor-customer relationship. That's a big issue. Um, there was just a Ninth Circuit opinion that came out over the summer uh, in a case called AYA versus AMN. And uh, you know we can get the site for that to you. Uh, that analyzed the situation that people have been asking about, which is that the um, the the um, buyer uh, had a no poach clause when it was acquiring uh, travel nurses from the uh, um, uh, the contractee that was providing travel nurses to this other entity that 
you know, provided travel nurses. And in order to have that agreement be uh, effective, uh, the, the, the larger company, AMN, put a no poach agreement in it, saying you can't, you can't poach our employees or our, our travel nurses. And the court, the Ninth Circuit in this case, analyzed it and found that it was not naked, found that that, that, that was necessary to the agreement to make it work. So the court said the no poach agreement was valid and should not be stricken from the from the uh, agreement or damages given to the smaller uh, travel nurse company. So um, we go to the next slide. I, I hope that answers a, a few of those uh, questions about vertical relationships. This is a developing area of the law that is by no means the final answer, but that's the first circuit court case I've seen analyzing those vertical issues. There are other cases in healthcare, and we did have a question about whether whether uh, this applies to other industries than healthcare. And you wouldn't know from the examples we're giving, but uh, yes, it does. And when I was at DOJ, there were uh, a number of cases uh, brought in the Silicon Valley involving Apple and companies like that. Uh, they were not criminal, they were civil. Uh, and now we've moved to this sort of criminal enforcement with civil being done largely either by the states or by private uh, counsel. Uh, so as an example of a state uh, antitrust claim is this Illinois versus elite staffing. And then um, another example of, of a case that's out there, uh, the US versus Geisinger uh, started out as a, as a uh, government action alleging an illegal partial merger between Geisinger and another hospital in Pennsylvania. And in the course of investigating that you know, partial merger, DOJ found a no poach agreement between the two hospitals. So um, uh, the, uh, the, the lawsuit against the two hospitals was resolved by DOJ, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the nurses who felt they were affected by the no poach agreement brought a class action. And that's what that Lieb versus Geisinger Medical Center case is. So I think we, I'm not sure we go to next. Kevin. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm gonna just interject here for a minute and um, appreciate your kind of overview of the Ninth Circuit case. And I think this is a burning question on, on every a lot of folks' minds are, you know, what about the non-competes or restrictive covenants that contain non-compete provisions um, in various types of uh, sort of legitimate business uh, agreements? Um, and, you know, the short answer, <laughs> although this area of the law is changing, as Kevin will talk about, is that, you know, these, these covenants not to compete that are in uh, sort of a, a it's part of a larger legitimate business arrangement between competitors. So for example, the sale of a business, a joint venture agreement, um, even a vendor agreement. In these contexts, these non-competes um, typically and most likely do not violate antitrust law so long as they are uh, reasonably necessary to achieve the lawful business purpose of the larger agreement and they're reasonably limited in scope. So, um, you know, what is what is reasonably limited in scope uh, necessarily depends on uh, the state, particular state laws at issue that relate to uh, non-compete provisions. Um, but typically, um, you know, these non-compete provisions are, are treated differently from naked no poach or non solicitation agreements that are not uh, have no connection whatsoever to any kind of larger legitimate business arrangement between the competitors. Um, but that said, as I mentioned, there are changes on the horizon at both the fate, federal and state levels. And so I'm going to turn over now to Kevin to give you an overview of what's coming down the pike. Thanks, Wendy. So I, I'm not a former uh, federal or state prosecutor. I'm just a, a simple employment lawyer, and I, I deal with non-compete agreements day in, day out. And yeah, uh, traditionally, non-compete enforceability has been a state-specific inquiry. There's definitely been a recent uh, push on the federal level 
to uh, more uniformly regulate those sort of agreements moving forward. Uh, I want to draw y'all's attention to uh, in, in July, on July 9th, President Biden signed this executive order on promoting competition in the American economy. And while the order, it actually contains 72 different initiatives, you know, directives to a variety of federal agencies. The one that specifically uh, pertains to, to our discussion today is uh, his direction or the executive order's direction to both DOJ and to the FTC to consider adopting regulations that would, uh, quote, curtail the unfair use of non-compete clauses that may unfairly limit worker mobility. And so th this order, the executive order in, the, in and of itself, it's not, it's not law, it's just a directive to the agency. So it doesn't have any immediate impact on the use or the policing of non-competes. Uh, it's just a directive, but it's definitely reflective of some of the recent state efforts we've also seen to either eliminate the use of non-competes or to you know, limit the use of non-competes. Uh, there's also been recent uh, legislative activity in this in this uh, area. The, the Workplace Mobility Act of 2021 is a bipartisan proposal before the House and the Senate. Uh, it would uh, limit the use of non-competes except for in certain situations, like the, the situation Wendy was just talking about, the sale of a business, a joint venture, a partnership dissolution. That, you know, if this act passed, uh, you know, non-competes would potentially only be valid in those sort of circumstances. The second piece of legislation that's pending is this Freedom to Compete Act. And uh, it uh, sort of more closely mirrors what we're seeing on a state level in, in, in some states, not here in Texas, but in others. Uh, the Freedom to Compete Act, if it passed, it would potentially prohibit the use of non-competes for hourly or non-exempt employees, folks that are non-exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act who are entitled to overtime. That's generally employees who make $50,000 or less a year. Uh, and if, if that was the case, uh, then those, these sort of agreements would be pro prohibited uh, for hourly workers uh, on a go forward basis. If uh, you could go to the next slide, Wendy, please. So yeah, state trends, uh, you know, the, the efforts uh, we've seen through President Biden, Biden and the uh, federal legislature, it's, it's, it's mirroring what we're seeing on a state level. Uh, there's three states in, in the country that just outright ban non-competes. That's California, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. They're still permitted to some extent in the, in the other 47 states. But you know, here recently in the past two or three years, we've had a, a variety of uh, new laws passed in states and the District of Columbia that significantly limit the use of non-competes. Uh, I'll, I'll dive into those more state-specific issues in, in further detail in the next slides. But uh, the majority of the activity has uh, been with regard to limiting non-competes for lower wage employees. A lot of this uh, was spurred by uh, you know, the Obama administration initially. Uh, there was a, a lot of scrutiny that was given uh, actually to the Jimmy John sandwich uh, shop uh, business. They uh, faced some litigation by two or three state attorneys general that uh, went and tried to bust their non-competes. They were uh, having their sandwich uh, makers sign agreements that said they wouldn't work for a competing sandwich shop uh, within two miles of any Jimmy John's location for up to two years after their employment ended. And you know that grew, drew a lot of scrutiny because you know they're requiring these low level hourly uh, workers to uh, you know so, sort of sign away their livelihood in some respects. Uh, and when they're you know not not the type of employees that typically get you know confidential information, trade secret type information that would typically justify the use of a non-compete. So that drew a lot of uh, scrutiny. Wendy, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, you know, Jimmy John's was not the only company that was using this tactic. You know, lots of other folks were were uh, playing sort of on the same field. But they're the ones who really uh, got the most attention dr drawn on them. This is a, a map from uh, our friends at Bloomberg that shows sort of the trends that we've got going on across the country with regard to limitations on non-competes. Uh, several states, you know, you see on the West Coast, on the East Coast, sort of from the Pacific Northwest and Washington, down through California, uh, Maine, down to Virginia and D.C., they're really making efforts to either put, you know, strong limitations on the use of non-competes, you know, uh, thresholds on what sort of workers can be subject to non-competes and, and who cannot. And uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll dive in deeper into some of these individual state issues. 
So uh, in terms of specific changes to non-compete laws, you see District of Columbia, like California, North Dakota, Oklahoma, just recently, they've enacted a near total ban on non-competes. There are some exceptions. You know, if you're a physician, for instance, who uh, you know, makes more than $250,000 a year, you could still be uh, potentially subject to a non-compete. Uh, interestingly, in, in D.C., they've also put this new uh, law into place where uh, companies are pro prohibited from retaliating against their employees if they refuse to uh, sign a non-compete or refuse to comply with a non-compete. So, you know, not only might you uh, face, you know, scrutiny on the government side if you uh, are operating in D.C. and you put one of these sort of agreements in place on a go-forward basis, uh, an employee could have a private uh, right of action to sue you for it. Uh, much of the other activity, like I talked about, has been around uh, states banning non-competes non uh, for workers based on certain pay thresholds, uh, a variety of different approaches here that you can see. But uh, you know, overall, the developments have begun to limit non-competes similar to what we're seeing in that proposed legislation under the Freedom, Not, or the Freedom to Compete Act, you know, lower level, hourly, non-exempt workers. But in some instances, you know, Illinois, Washington, Oregon, you know, we're not just talking about uh, hourly or non-exempt employees. You're also talking about your salaried workers. And if they don't make, you know, $75,000 a year or more, or, you know, Oregon, Washington State, $100,000 a year or more, those states are outright banning non-competes for those sort of workers. And I've got uh, one more slide, Wendy, please. Yeah, so uh, other interesting de developments, you know, sort of outside that pay threshold. Illinois and Oregon, they, they put new timing requirements uh, into non-competes. No longer can you just stick a non-compete in front of somebody and, and tell them to sign it on the day that they start. They've got to be given, you know, in, in Illinois and Oregon at least 14 days prior to the employment uh, period to sort of review the agreement, have their attorney look at it if they want to. Other states are, you know, imposing maximum length of restrictions. You no longer can you say 12 or 24, 36 months on a non-compete. The trend is definitely more towards, you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, Massachusetts, Oregon, Washington also have this new garden pay leave requirement. Essentially what that means is if you're going to subject somebody to a non-compete, uh, you have to pay them for their time to sit on the bench and not compete against you, you know, up to certain, uh, you know, limits there. Uh, the length of employment, too, has, has become an issue. In Illinois, you can't uh, subject somebody to a non-compete until they've worked for you for at least two years, which I find interesting because oftentimes you want to put that sort of protection in place at the outset so that you, you know, don't have somebody sort of learn the secret sauce and leave you know, six months into employment and go compete with you. Illinois says uh, that's not an you know, appropriate justification anymore. You've got to have them, you know, they've got to work for you for a minimum of two years before they start. So. All in all, lots of activity in this space. You know, I only expect it to increase on a, on a state level, certainly, and, and perhaps on a federal level, too, going forward. Uh, again, non-competes are still uh, permitted in most states as we sit uh, right now, but uh, you know, so sometimes with fairly significant limitations. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Mark, and he's going to talk about uh, risk reduction strategies in the antitrust space. And let me just stress that these risk reduction strategies don't really go to Kevin's area. There may be different things you'll want to do to talk to, to deal with the uh, changing landscape with non-competes. What I'm talking about here is no poach and wage fixing. Um, it's a, you know, uh, best practices are evolving in this area, um, you know, you should make it clear that such agreements are prohibited and not permitted, you know, clearly it makes sense to put a regime in place where people are trained, you know, and educated on these topics, including um, senior executives, because in some cases it's the CEO that, you know, unfortunately made an agreement that's alleged to have been a no poach or wage fixing agreement, uh, talking to the CEO or a senior manager at another company. Um, you know, if you see something, say something and, you know, definitely get a, a, a regime in place to tell managers that you've seen something. I think it makes sense to, you know, audit or check in some way to see if you have such an agreements in place. And uh, if, if you do, I mean, I think 
you should, you know, consult with um, skilled counsel um, because these things can result in some liability. Uh, obviously, training your people, uh, trying to prevent uh, these kinds of agreements from being made. There's another slide. We can go to the other slide um, mm -hmm. on this. Uh, but, um, you know, review your policies, review your, your practices, including your hiring practices, um, and do, do training and implement and check back and make sure that people understood what you trained them on. And then I think that training should be even broader because it looks like antitrust law is getting broader in its emphasis now on labor markets. So do antitrust compliance training. Um, there were questions about information surveys and wage surveys. Um, I'm uh, not sure we're going to get to that, but those those kinds of things, you know, there are um, guidelines that that I think DOJ and FTC will probably revisit about when those are permitted. I see the liability for those kinds of surveys as going up these days. Uh, and so be very careful in that area. Um, so that's all I have on risk reduction strategies. Turn it over to Jody though. Yeah, so this is sort of the what happens if. Um you know if if you are faced with the very unfortunate situation where the federal government is you know sending subpoenas or knocking on the door or there is a civil lawsuit or or even an internal whistleblower who is you know making assertions um of you know no poach or wage fixing conduct um you know, first and foremost, I, I think it is really wise to make sure that, you know, there is skilled, good legal representation in place. Uh, often that, you know, comes from in-house and that's wonderful. Uh, sometimes there's a need to either add or hire outside counsel. But I, I do think it's really important to have um, skilled counsel who's sort of aware of the evolving landscape um, on these issues. Once that's you know in place, then it's really time to address the the practicalities. Um, there are some things that need quick, um, fast actions, and those include a litigation hold or um, preservation memorandum. You know that is sent around so that nothing gets deleted, discarded, or destroyed uh, during the course of, of what's about to take place. Um, and also, you know, turning off all of the auto delete and auto archiving features in the IT system. And that can go hand in hand with identifying relevant custodians who might be those whose, you know, emails and other correspondence would relate to what's going on here. Following that up, you know, an internal investigation is always a very good idea. Um, and again, with counsel, you know, much of that is, is cloaked in privilege and that's a, a good thing. Um, it is smart to understand the, the landscape of the law, state and federal, or if it's a plaintiff's lawyer who's, you know, coming at this, um, really understand what are the theories here? Where are the risks? What is happening? And how do the facts that, that exist in our organization relate or maybe better yet don't relate um, to to the theories uh, that might be being pursued. Um, good idea to sort of take a look at the anti-competitive consequences of what's being alleged, um, understand the law as it relates to those anti-competitive con uh, consequences, both state and federal. And then if there really is a problem, um, it is not a bad idea to consider, and again, this, this requires consultation with skilled counsel, but to consider a self-report. Um, because there are um, there are some benefits that can be had from the corporate compliance program uh, within the Department of Justice's uh, antitrust division. And then finally, uh, compliance training uh, is always smart. And that's, um, you know, that should be an ongoing thing, uh, but a long term goal to sort of keep compliance training up to date and, and ongoing. Um, so I'm not sure if we have um, much time left, but I, I do want to turn it over um, to Mark or Wendy to sort of wrap it up on that, and then I'll give us some closing comments. 
Yeah, thanks, Jody. Just a quick note about information sharing and salary benchmarking or surveys about uh, salary since it's come up a lot in the chat. Um, relatively, it presents relatively low antitrust risk to participate in, in these types of surveys if um, it's conducted for pro-competitive reasons and it's structured appropriately. So the structured appropriately part um, is really if it meets the DOJ FTC guidance that's set forth in healthcare statement number six, which is that the information number one is historical, so older than three months, um, that the, the number of participants are such that uh, you won't be able to discern any particular participant's identity, so uh, it's sufficiently blinded and aggregated. And then finally, um, that it's conducted by an independent third party who's neutral, and uh, they're the ones responsible for collecting housing and aggregating the information and the results. Um, so I really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Jody. I'll leave it to you to, to finish up here, but, but thanks again for folks Great questions. Yeah, th thank you. Terrific questions. What we didn't get to, we will um, try and get to afterward as promised. And I'll keep the key takeaway slides up while I just give you some, some closing comments. Um, thanks for joining us. We certainly hope this was helpful um, and, and interesting for you and your organization. There's a lot here and a lot to unpack. So by all means, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, if we you know, didn't get to you or you have some follow-up questions that you didn't get to post. If you haven't already, if you would be so kind as to click on the survey icon at the bottom of your screen and complete the survey, we'd really appreciate it. Your feedback helps us to plan future programs. As a reminder, uh, this program is approved for CLE credit. So download the certificate of attendance form on the certificate widget <laughs> is what it says on my notes at the bottom of your screen. Uh, a recording of this podcast will be available for you tomorrow if you want to rewatch or share. Once uh, it is available, a link will be emailed to you. And that is it for us. I want to respect your time and let you get on with your day. Thanks for joining us.